Hi, my name's Vince Sheehan and today I'd like to talk about The Spanish Armada by Robert Hutchinson. I'd like to go through this historical uh, book exploring um, how it's structured and how it illuminates the reader on this failed invasion of England by the Spanish in the summer of 1588. This book was first published in 2013, by the way. I've always been fascinated with the Spanish Armada. I remember as a boy going to um, an exhibition in Greenwich in London. I remember it really capturing my imagination at the time and uh, it's been really good to go back and read a bit more about it in this book. Now um, Hutchinson writes this in um, 11 chapters uh, as well as a prologue and an epilogue and uh, there are lengthy appendices and chronologies and glossaries at the back of this book. The prologue really deals with uh, the background um, to Elizabethan England and politics on the European stage. It outlines um, Elizabeth's difficult upbringing, her unstable and insecure upbringing uh, remember her father, Henry VIII, had, uh, had various acts about who would succeed him as monarch and he changed his mind several times. And uh, of course Elizabeth, her fate often fluctuated between um, being next on the chopping block or, um, or being the next in line to the throne. When uh, Queen Elizabeth succeeds her half-sister Mary, on November the 17th, 1558. There are some unresolved issues determining the destiny of English Christendom. Is it going to be Catholic or Protestant? And these tensions eventually are focused in the events 30 years later in the Spanish Armada. And remember Philip II, who launches the Armada, was married to Mary I, uh, the Queen before Elizabeth. So, at one point he was King of England and Ireland. Now, in the first chapter, Hutchinson dwells on the tensions in England and the threat of um, Catholicism to Elizabeth's uh, throne from both within England and from influences without England. The chapter also dwells on um, Mary Queen of Scots, who seemed to be a thorn in Elizabeth's side for many years. Um, she was a Catholic, a cousin to Elizabeth I, who had a claim to the throne, uh, as she was uh, Henry VIII's sister's daughter. Elizabeth and her advisers were fearful of the trouble she could make in the realm um, and indeed uh, Mary didn't seem to help things herself she very much wanted to stir things up in England and eventually uh, Elizabeth had no choice but to execute her in Fotheringay Castle on the 8th of February 1587 a year before the Armada now chapter two is all about this event called the singeing of the king's beard. We're now in 1587 and France, Sir Francis Drake, who's a favourite of the Queen, but is also basically a glorified pirate, is uh, sailing the seas, causing all kinds of mayhem and destruction, pain on uh, Philip II's uh, fleets, particularly around the New World. Indeed, the Spanish nickname Sir Francis Drake, the Dragon. He seems to be driven by greed, Francis Drake, and he just um, disrupts Spanish trade, stealing gold bullion, making himself fabulously wealthy, and also doing much to boost the coffers of, of the Queen's purse. The Queen and her advisers, particularly Walsingham, who's like a spy master, they, um, they receive intelligence that Philip II is amassing an armada 
perhaps exacerbated by the antics of Sir Francis Drake, the dragon, but also by England's uh, interference with the Spanish Netherlands, it seemed to be uh, a bit too close to comfort for uh, Elizabeth uh, in terms of uh, Catholic influence. So this armada is being amassed, but before it can set sail, Sir Francis Drake just uh, raided the Bay of Cadiz, destroying as many Spanish ships as he could, causing havoc, disrupting preparations for the planned invasion. The singeing of the king's beard, what a great expression. Chapter 3, um, Hutchison writes, basically, this evasion attempt is going to happen, notwithstanding Sir Francis Drake's efforts, and England prepares for the inevitable, and England is ill-prepared. The state of the English army and the uh, various militias up and down the, the land, the, the coastal defences, um, the state of the navy, they're all rather disorganised and uh, poorly funded. So there's work to be done. Chapter 4 concerns itself with the, the reports and the espionage on both sides, the English and the Spanish, about what exactly is going to happen and when. In Chapter 5, uh, finally, under the reluctant leadership of the Duke of Medina Sidonia, he claimed he didn't have enough experience at sea. Um, the Armada finally set sail from um, Lisbon in Portugal. But no sooner has the, the fleet set sail, it's beset by bad luck from the, from the off. Storms, um, provisions going bad and rotting, uh, lack of communication, lack of support. Uh, between uh, the seventh Duke of Medina Sidonia and Philip II, King Philip II. Um, it's just a shambles from the beginning. But they persevere and soon enough we have the first skirmishes between the Spanish and English fleets around Cornwall. And the, um, the English fleet is led by Charles Howard, um, John Hawkins as well, and, uh, and Francis Drake, of course. He is very much um, a central figure in this. Now, the Armada is a mighty spectacle on the seas, uh, an intimidating sight, according to the English fleets. But the ships are rather cumbersome, and they're progressing along the English Channel in this kind of shield formation. And the English uh, ships, which are far more... Um, manoeuvrable, far more, far faster, quicker to turn around if need be. They seem to be able to pick off uh, many of the, the stragglers and kind of uh, harry the armada around the edges. Now it's worth noting at this point that the, the Spanish armada was meant to meet up with an army sent across to England from Belgium under the uh, command of the Duke of Parma. And uh, there was all this confusion um, about when and how this was going to happen. It wasn't very well organised and planned. So um, throughout the um, Armada's torturous progress at the English Channel, the Duke of Medina Sidonia and his uh, colleagues were kind of at their wits end wondering when and uh, how they were going to meet up with the Duke of Parma's forces. Because if they had met up and reached England, then it would have looked very bleak for England, uh, judging by the numbers planning to cross uh, over from mainland Europe, as well as the training of the army. So that's always in the back of uh, the Spanish mind here, and the English mind, because they know that uh, something like this is planned. While the Spanish dock off of Calais the English have a master stroke in terms of strategy. They uh, set fire to some ships, eight ships, fire ships, and they're sent in without a crew into the docked uh, Spanish fleet 
and it causes absolute uh, carnage, uh, terror, disorganisation, um, a collapse in discipline, all kinds of destruction. This really is um, one of the many low points uh, in the Spanish's uh, planned uh, invasion. Then the, the Spanish are kind of in disarray, their ships are dispersed, and the English hit hard during the Battle of Gravelines on the 8th of August 1588, where many of the main flagships of the Spanish Armada are uh, destroyed or forced out of action, and the remaining vessels are uh, shoved around the uh, south and east coast of England. Uh, this is really is where the, the Armada has failed in its objective. Uh, they failed to meet up with the Duke of Parma's forces, and now those, uh, those ships uh, are in uh, terrible danger of uh, not, only, uh, not only from the English fleet, but from shipwreck. The mission is a failure. It's here that Sidonia admits that the Spanish have just got to get home, but the only way they can do that is to circumnavigate the whole of the British Isles, um, going right round past Scotland and down the west coast of Ireland before they can go back into, into Spanish waters eventually. This is going to be a perilous journey and one which will cost them dear. It's here that Queen Elizabeth realises that the day is won and uh, although there's still a threat um, to a degree, the remains of this fleet going around uh, Britain, she knows that she is victorious and she delivers her famous speech at Tilbury in Essex, which is right by, by the Thames estuary. It's here she famously says, I have the body of a weak, feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king and of a King of England too. Justly famous and uh, stirring words, helping to cement her place as one of the true greats on the English throne throughout history. Now inevitably, um, Hutchinson outlines in chapter nine, the destruction of the Armada off the coasts of Scotland and the west coast of Ireland. And remember Ireland, is ruled by the English then. Even if Spanish, even if Spanish uh, sailors do manage to get to onto the shore of Ireland, they are quickly captured and imprisoned by local militias. Uh, there's very little mercy here. Many of them executed. The few remaining ships eventually crawl back to Spain. The Duke survives himself. So the Spanish are deep in despair this kind of uh, holy war has failed and uh, England are jubilant. Chapter 11, uh, Hutchinson informs us of the English Armada, which not many people know about, but the English kind of had a half-hearted attempt to um, go and sail to Spain themselves uh, with uh, Dudley, another one of the Queen's favourites, Robert Devereux. But it was an ill-planned, fated uh, effort, and it, it soon um, dissipated. In the epilogue, Hutchinson talks about how hostilities eventually wound down. Uh, James I ascended the throne after the death of Elizabeth, and, uh, and, and eventually the Treaty of London was signed. There was a, a now peace between um, England and Spain. Spain seemed to... Uh, except uh, England as being a Protestant uh, power uh, and it could, uh, as far as I'm concerned at the time, it could not be brought back to Catholicism. Now this book is a really, uh, you know, really engaging read. You know, it's kind of, uh, it's written in a, a style which could be described as kind of popular history um, I think sometimes Hutchinson describes things and perhaps we don't need to, which most people would know. I mean, there's one bit where he talks about um, Catholics being tortured on the rack and he describes what the rack is. I think many of us know what the rack is. Um, but generally, it's extremely 
interesting and uh, full of insights. And one thing which, uh, which stuck with me um, after reading this is the, the terrible treatment of the sailors, uh, particularly, you know, the English sailors. Uh, the Queen delivers her, her fabulous speech and the nation is in jubilation. But the poor sailors, the poor people on the boats who risked their lives and lived in squalid conditions, you know, starved, um, were basically not paid. <laughs> and they were, you know, they were left to kind of beg on the streets, etc. And then when the English Armada was launched, the kind of pathetic attempt to kind of uh, get back at the Spanish, they were promised all the wealth in the world, but of course they were left to starve and left destitute again. So you do feel for them, you know. Um, it also brings home about how, how Philip really th thought this as some kind of holy war, you know, he, he was very much... For him it wasn't just a uh, kind of a power or a kind of a land grab thing, although he could do with the finances. It was more a fact that he was restoring England to Catholicism after the heresy of the English Reformation. And uh, it's quite amusing to read about his dealings with the Pope here, Pope Sixtus V. He felt kind of duty bound to support this mission, but he wasn't really interested in parting with much cash, uh, much to Philip II's despair. And despite her Protestantism, he seemed to be a fervent admirer of Elizabeth I, which is, uh, is quite amusing uh, coming from the Pope. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's just a, fa a fascinating episode in British history. Um, and if you'd like to know a little more about the events of 1588 and the uh, relationship between England and Spain at the time and the uh, indeed the turmoil in England at the time concerning religion uh, between uh, Catholicism and Protestantism, then please uh, check this out. You know, it really is a good read. Thanks for watching and uh, goodbye.